Good day and welcome to the Center for International Law, National University of Singapore special program on the issues and trends that are at the front and center of the climate change conversation. I'm Jenny Algya, Ekjang Senior Research Fellow, lead on climate change law and policy issues at the center. Our program today examines the climate change and trade um, interface and discusses the insight from a recent white paper that was released in September 2021 by the World Economic Forum that was produced in collaboration with the global law firm Clifford Chance. The paper is entitled Delivering a Climate Trade Agenda Industry Insights and our discussion today will also explore how trade policy can support climate action. With that I'm very pleased today to welcome two contributors to the project. First off we have Ms. Kimberly Bortwright. She's the community lead on global trade and investment and a global leadership fellow at the World Economic Forum. She was formerly with the International Center for Trade and uh, Sustainable Development and also with the OECD. With her appearing today is uh, Mrs. Jeremy Stewart, this is from uh, Clifford Chance. Jeremy specializes in international trade and investment, public law and public international law. He advises regularly, he regularly advises rather, governments and corporate clients on a range of international trade and cross-border regulatory matters, including in relation to WTO law, free trade agreements, as well as trade remedies. He was formerly a senior legal advisor with the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He has appeared in disputes at the WTO and was also New Zealand's legal uh, lead for the Regional Comprehensive uh, Economic Partnership at the negotiations. Um, coming back to Kimberly, I should mention um, that she is uh, she holds an MA in economics, European economics policy from the Science School, and I hope I got that pronunciation correct, and a BA from the University of Oxford. So two very well qualified, <laughs> very eminent uh, uh, contributors uh, to this uh, interesting report, and I'm very pleased to have you here today. So good morning to both of you, and a very well warm welcome to a very cold Glasgow. <laughs> Now, we are now at the start of the second week of COP here in Glasgow, and many eyes are now turning with expectations to the outcomes that will emerge at the end of this week. And this will range from possibly, we don't know yet, updated NDCs that match the emissions uh, pledges made by political leaders last week. Uh, there is, of course, a highly anticipated outcome of the Article 6 carbon markets negotiation and delivery of climate finance to support and implement such climate actions, just to name a few. Aside from this agenda, however, there is an increasing consciousness of the effects of climate change and climate action on, among other things, and for the purposes of discussion this morning, global trade and vice versa. Now, many sectors of the global economy are expected to be affected by climate change, which in turn impacts on trade. They include sectors which are critical for developing countries, such as agriculture, fisheries, forestry. And the melting of the polar ice caps due to warmer weather will also impact on trade routes and as well as trade port infrastructure. Now, it was as recognized in the foreword to this white paper, the deep and rapid cuts in emissions of gas house, greenhouse gas emissions that are needed to stabilize the rising temperatures will require transformative changes by governments, businesses, and civil society in the transition to clean and sustainable economies. Now this rise raises, gives rise to the following questions. Is the nexus between trade and climate change sufficiently internalized? Everyone knows there's a link, but is it been sufficiently, has it been sufficiently internalized? And whether and how governments ensure coherence between these two regimes? This question is also relevant from a public international law perspective, particularly in terms of the nexus and coherence of the international trade and climate change legal framework. So this white paper is a very con a timely contribution to the discussion and the conversation um, on the trade climate nexus, published um, this year as well by the World Bank and the Conrad Adenio Stiftung Foundation. So it does show that the growing consciousness and awareness of this critical issue. 
Turning now to the white paper. I'll turn now to Beth Kimberly and to Jeremy. Could you briefly share to, uh, with us what's the background to this paper? What considerations drove this report? What was the need or the deficiency that was identified? Jeremy, Kimberly? I'll, I'll kick it off and then maybe Jeremy can come in on, on, on how Clifford Chance joined us in wanting to write this report. So at least from the World Economic Forum side, we've, we have quite an active uh, community on climate action. We have our CEO climate leaders who push for higher ambition and are aligning their companies with uh, 1.5 degree or science-based uh, targets. Um, and there we felt that increasingly questions around trade and competitiveness were coming up. So there was an interest from, from their side to further explore these issues. There was an interest also on carbon pricing and, and market linkages and Article 6. So they also wanted to unpack that. Um, and then importantly, from the trade community side, so the, the I sit on the forum's trade team, uh, increasingly governments were coming to us and saying that they wanted to develop a uh, trade climate agenda. So they wanted to use trade negotiations or trade discussions for climate action, but that they weren't sure what exactly would be the biggest priority and where should they intervene, what would be most welcome, uh, and what would gather support. So we felt that it would be really important to talk to the businesses that are working on decarbonization and understand where there are potentially cross-border issues that may uh, present challenges to that decarbonization or whether there were indeed also opportunities of things that could be facilitated or policies that could be better aligned so that they could go faster or that it would help them achieve their goals more efficiently. Jeremy from your side? Yeah no thanks Kelly. I, I think that's, that's absolutely right. We, we could the chance got involved I think because what's what's clear is that you know climate is becoming an increasingly you know central element to what our clients are, are grappling with, particularly when they're working, um, you know, internationally and, and across borders. And I think what we've seen, in, you know, increasingly, and it's it's coming to a head with you know policies like CBAM and others. We're coming to this point where, uh, you know, there is, in some instances, a tension between trade and climate policy that needs to be kind of looked at and understood so that we can understand how those two worlds can come together in a harmonious way that's actually kind of mutually supportive rather than coming into conflict. And so I think really understanding what the linkages are is, is an important first step to understanding how, you know, the climate world, the trade world and, uh, you know, the business community can all kind of work together in a coherent way in, in achieving these objectives. Because, you know, I think it's it's now at a point where it's it's beyond any doubt, you know, whether you're in, in the private sector or, or the public sector or in NGOs, that, that, you know, climate change is the central issue that we need to be addressing now and all policy levers need to make some contribution to that. Thanks very much, Kimberly and Jeremy. That, that's very helpful. And that's actually quite interesting because what you see here is almost a, a parallel sort of parallel autonomous convergence of interests. On the one hand, you have the ministers, the political leaders, policymakers recognizing the need um, and then coming to uh, approaching the, uh, the World, World Economic Forum in this case uh, with, a, with, 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 a, with a indication of that need uh, that internalizes uh, the recognition that something, uh, there's a gap perhaps that needs to be plugged. What I'm interested in, Kimberly, is that you mentioned governments came to you. Now, what is the profile of these governments? Do they range from developed and developing countries, do you find? Or do they represent particular constituencies? Yeah, I think initially it's usually the governments who already have, have started with uh, quite an ambitious um, climate action plan. So, so they're, that, from their perspective, they're, really, they're already interested and invested in the climate agenda. They're sort of the, the champions within our space here, the UNFCCC space, and then they want to layer on top the, the trade policy angle. Um, I think it's been probably a little bit more challenging to engage the governments, particularly from least developed um, and, and low income economies, particularly post COVID. There's a lot of challenges that they're dealing with in that space. And the trade climate linkages are really complex and, and require that uh, dialogue across uh, ministries. And, and, and that's maybe something that they have had less bandwidth for at the moment. But we're hoping that going forward, we can really engage them because this, this will affect them. And there's maybe also some opportunities for, for them to think through. That's, that's, thank you, Kimberly. And, and maybe I can turn to, to Jeremy also to understand a little bit 
about the kind of profile of the clientele that come that came to you, came comes to came to you with the same set of questions, the same set of interests. Do they tend to be large multinationals? Do they tend to be SMEs? Uh, do they tend to come from different particular sectors, for example? Yeah, so I mean, we, we tried, and particularly the companies that we interviewed for the report, we tried to get sort of a, a range of, of sectors. That was sort of one objective was to ensure that we had, um, you know, not just, um, uh, you know, energy companies or transport companies or, or, or consumer goods companies, but we had understood a perspective um, from each of those sectors. So we, we've got a broad range there. Um, and, and in terms of, of jurisdictions, I mean, I think we thought it was quite helpful. I mean, we as an international open deal deal primarily with, with larger clients and, and often um, firms who are operating in, in a number of different markets. But I think what what's quite interesting about talking to those um, sort of companies is that they they do have a, a wide ranging perspective about how a lot of different markets work, what's what's working, what's difficult, what um, you know, what friction sort of arises when you you bring together trade and climate issues and and, and have a plurality of kind of different domestic policies and, and grappling with this. So I think we we've primarily dealt with with those larger companies, but I think what you know many of these sort of issues are are, are relevant across the, the spectrum more broadly i mean i think for for smes for example you know thinking about how um you know making it easier for, for smes to, to to trade internationally by by harmonizing regulations and and having sort of more coherence in, in a policy sense it actually probably benefits smes at least as much as it does um sort of larger companies so i think some of the the recommendations that come out of this are, are, are kind of you know more broadly applicable uh, thank you. It's, I think it's useful to know because in terms of the utility and a reference point, this, this report will be, uh, the white paper definitely will be reviewed and, and read widely. Um, and it's, it's very useful, uh, pertinent to really understand the drivers, uh, where the need arose and, and which sectors and, and which constituency, for instance. Uh, and then I guess then the responses can be also quite targeted and quite deliberate as well. Um, we will come to that a little bit later, if I may, to canvas the follow-up action. Uh, but perhaps it will be useful at this point for me to then turn to the contents of the report. Um, and I would invite you to perhaps share firstly the main observations, um, of findings, uh, pertinent points from your respective uh, discussions and interviews uh, before we turn to the recommendations. Because I, th I think it's quite a rich report and it does cover many interesting aspects. I want to make sure we devote enough time to that. Sure, maybe I'll start with, with some of it. So we, we divided the uh, our understanding of what the challenges and the interlinkages were into two sections. Maybe I'll start with the first and then pass over to Jeremy, who was critical, uh, particularly on leading the second. So our two sections were uh, traditional trade issues and how those trade policy levers can affect climate action. And then the second was non-traditional, but or rather very specific to the climate trade nexus. So maybe less applicable to to, to a broader trade discussion, um, or rather unique to that particular nexus. Um, on, the, on the traditional trade policy levers, we looked and we heard from companies the importance of having a stable, open, non-discriminatory global trading system. So the principles of the WTO and, and the FTAs that are laid on top of that, that system that we have in place is important for companies because they indicate that there's significant amounts of investment that have to be made over the next few years. So having a stable, environment really will help them uh, to make those decisions and to, to move capital where it needs to be and to, to make the transition. Um, they indicated... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I wanted to just check on the follow on the point that you, you mentioned, because it's interesting that businesses, I mean, of course, perhaps not unexpected that businesses would raise this as an issue. Is this a problem that they face right now? Do they feel, especially in the light of the last few years, we've had trade frictions, we've had, you know, trade wars, do they feel that the current climate actually is not conducive uh, at the moment? There's too much uncertainty. Uh -huh. Exactly. You beat me to it. That was exactly why they raised the point, because they raised right. it to say, that's the system we need. In many cases, <laughs> we don't have that system today. We don't have that um, system, yeah. And particularly when you have the largest markets in the world, the EU, uh, sorry, the US and China, but also now in some cases, the EU embroiled in, in trade disputes. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. really is problematic. Whether those trade disputes are specific to um, 
uh, climate industry areas. So, for example, we've seen quite a lot of disputes around clean energy um, or just even the, the broader trade disputes. It, that in and of themselves also creates challenges in terms of the risk of not being clear of what environment they operate in, what, you know, understanding whether their supplies hit, who they can import from, et cetera, et cetera. Supply chain is a big issue, that's right. Yes. And, and to add some colour to that, I mean, you know, these these investments, I think, are they're really long term investments that are, you know, going to be made in, in transitioning to to net zero. And so, if you're a company, you know, thinking about where to place a new factory or, um, uh, you know, make a, a big investment in, in renewable generation or, or otherwise, you're going to be really, you know, you're going to really require the certainty that there's not going to be trade barriers slapped on to that jurisdiction and to your other markets. Um, yeah. And so, I think really, uh, you know, uh, that that could have illustrates that this is not a, a climate specific problem but the nature and the scale of the investments in the space that that need to be made um really escalated and make it you know a key climate climate issue i think and that's absolutely true i mean we're looking at horizons a time a time horizons investment of minimum 10 20 years um and in the context of the ongoing discussion there's so much talk about technology uh, there's so much talk about public private a partnership and, and, and you know, wanting businesses and private finance to come in. Uh, this really is the basic minimum uh, in certainty. I, I heard that buzzword along the corridors quite a lot this week on the sidelines of the discussion. So that, that's very helpful to know that this mm -hmm. observation is backed up by, by, by through the interviews that you've had. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, sorry, if you could continue. I'm sorry for interrupting but I sure. thought that was a useful no, point. No, to emphasize. It, and it was striking that actually it was a point that was raised by, I would say, a majority of the businesses that we spoke to. Um, so I thought that was, that was quite striking. Um, so a second area that some of them raised was the challenges around market distortions. So mm -hmm. intervention, fossil fuel subsidies, um, but also other types of, uh, of market distortions can equally affect their planning and act as a counterweight to what they're trying to do. So they just signaled that particularly fossil fuel subsidies were, were unhelpful. Um, then, and again, that's more something that we've been discussing for a little while within the trade policy community on how we could discipline um, distortive uh, fossil fuel subsidies linked to what we've done elsewhere on, on market distorting subsidies. Then some of them raised uh, a whole uh, series of concerns around non-tariff barriers. So um, issues like lo local content requirements uh, that can really impact uh, how they would be able to access a market or distribute a technology. Um, there were a few other uh, concerns raised also around things like licensing, um, et cetera. So that really impedes their ability once they have, this was particularly coming from folks who'd be looking to um, accelerate the distribution of certain clean, low carbon technologies that, that, that held them back from entering new markets. Um, and again, that's something that is probably within the remit of, of traditional trade policy that we sort of know how we could go about addressing that. And we've, we've done that uh, before and we do it in FTAs. If you um, may ask you, Billy, um, on, the, on this non-tariff uh, non, non barriers, um, did your interviews disclose um, that being a problem more acute in certain regions of the world or certain it, jurisdictions? So it came up in the major... All major markets were mentioned. Um, <laughs> big, the big three big major markets right. were mentioned having uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Paris, exactly. Useful to know. It's very useful to know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I think something that also was interesting about this is that while many companies flagged challenges around non-tariff barriers, um, I think they were still in the exploratory mode of trying to understand and formulate uh, the the picture in a way that trade policymakers could understand. Um, and that's, I know, something that they want to do more going forward. That if there is an interest from trade policymakers to work on non-tariff barriers, it's a little bit more complex to do that than it is just negotiating over tariffs. And businesses also need to be very clear on what exactly is the market access issue, if you will, that, that they want policymakers to solve. And, and also what's the priority? Are there certain non-tariff barriers that would be the most pertinent to address? So lo local content requirements were, were raised a lot, um, mm -hmm. but maybe there are others. And then also thinking about uh, local content requirements usually come because of a political reason. So how can we navigate that? Um, and what would be the sort of 
easy and obvious agenda for, for policymakers to, to move forward in discussion with each other if they were interested to. So th those were some of the discussions that we started to have in that space. Um, Is there any issue of transparency with this non-tariff area? Yeah, I, I think that was also some of the challenge is that, and I think several companies raised uh, lack of transparency as as a, a, a around how uh, what the regulatory requirements were as as an issue. Um, this yeah. is supposed to be um, notified after all to the WTO, and, and I think not everybody yeah. does diligently. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, just quickly on the last two more traditional trade areas linked to non-tariff areas, there was also a lot of comments raised around diversity of standards. Um, so if you have different standards for low carbon technologies evolving in different markets, that, that just places an additional burden on business um, to also know how they develop that technology, whether it qualifies or not. That was, for example, the case with raised around sustainable aviation fuels, um, among others. And then lastly, uh, trade in the sector economy came up. So we built uh, a trade system for linear flows that works very well. Um, I think many companies felt that they're really keen to implement sector economy plans. In some cases they can, but often there is a cross-border trade issue cropping up more and more, whether it's the ability to access recycled content for, for products in all different markets, or whether it's about bringing a recycled product back to a facility where it can be reprocessed. They often encountered a lot of trouble around that, partly linked to, to environmental regulation, but that's something that, again, would need to be uh, discussed across policy communities. Um, so maybe that's a good segue over to the non-traditional or the trade climate unique nexus that we also explored. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think it's a really good summary. And, and I think, you know, as the, the overarching theme with those ones, I think is that, you know, given the nature and the scale of these investments, new technologies, you know, really big scale, long-term, it's really important that we, you know, don't forget many of the core trade issues that are, you know, that, that underpin much of this. But I think there's also this emerging um, kind of category of climate trade specific issues. And what what has sort of come out, and this is starting to sort of manifest directly in certain policies um, that, that, are, that, are, that are coming out, is that as, as countries kind of move at different speeds and in different ways towards achieving their own domestic, um, you know, climate commitments, that has the potential to create, you know, trade friction and trade issues. And so one of the um, you know, key points that, that, that companies raised with us is the importance of sort of having some consistency in how those uh, policies are, are applied. And so, you know, to take the example of, um, you know, uh, you know, carbon, um, measuring embedded carbon, for example. So if you have, you know, uh, three different countries that are sort of implementing their own, you know, border adjustments or their own kind of uh, um, mechanisms for uh, pricing carbon, taxing carbon. Um, if those are applied using different methodologies, then that's going to create a really challenging situation to, to do business in. And so this idea of a, a level playing field, which is a term that's that's brought up and means many different things to many different people, I think it, it, it was mentioned a lot in our interviews, but I think what it really means in this context is sort of understanding and having some you know coherence between different jurisdictions with respect to the price signals which are going to send them um, you know on their journey to net zero because overarching theme I think universally from the interviews is that companies know that you know this this change is coming they're, they're preparing for it but whether they you know are going going to go net zero in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years that's a a, a real um, you know that's going to be affected by by policy interventions mm -hmm. and the more uh you know disparate those policy interventions are and, and the less kind of coherence you have the more difficult it's going to be to to really you know accelerate that action so that's kind of a, a, a one one kind of key thing and, and i think the other one which is i think very related to that is this broader idea of um, you know sort of different measurement uh, methodologies, and I think one of the big themes talking to, uh, to to companies is that they say, look, we are we are trying within our own um, uh, you know operations to to start measuring our emissions, and, and countries uh, companies were on different um, 
you know, uh, different um, extents of development of that. But I think one of the key difficulties that they all kind of came and said, look, scope three is, is very challenging to understand exactly, you know, where our missions start and stop. And it depends which, which country we're, we're operating with or what methodology we're using. And that's only going to become more um, important and more challenging once that's tied into actual, you know, regulatory mechanisms that require mandatory disclosure or they require, um, you know, pricing at the border, like in a, in, in a carbon border adjustment type mechanism. So those are issues which are, are difficult, um, but I think it's very clear now that they are on the horizon. And so we need to start sort of talking about what that looks like. And I think, you know, we have seen even even this week over the, over the week of, of first week of COP26, a lot of discussion about sort of, you know, pricing mechanisms, um, you know, the, the WTO Director General has now been talking about, you know, how we come towards pricing carbon um, internationally um, and, and the trade linkages of that. So I think there's a lot of talk now that is that is actually, you know, advanced beyond the kind of theoretical stage and, and is actually, you know, looking to develop solutions more more specifically for these for these issues, which I think is extremely, extremely positive because it does require, you know, some real work. I think that's absolutely true. And, and, and this time you beat me to it, Jeremy, because I was actually going to refer to uh, WTO DG and uh, Yosi's uh, uh, op-ed in, in the Financial Times, where she talked about, and, I, I, and, and uh, her, 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 her op-ed really brings to the fore what he had described, the rubber hitting the road in terms of in the what tangible ways do we see this very unique uh, clash. Uh, I wouldn't even use the word clash. I would say interaction because I, I think we've not necessarily come to the point where the two systems collide and are inconsistent. I think we've come to the point that we know that they interact. We need to understand how they interact, uh, what disciplines uh, apply and what new disciplines or adjustments or modified disciplines need to be in place. And, and the, the, the issue of the, the carbon, uh, uh, what, what uh, DG Nozzi uh, talked about was a common sort of a global carbon price. And I think that's helpful in, in, in as, a, as an example to illustrate why there is a, this sort of a need for a level playing field. Um, pointing the finger exactly at what you mentioned in terms of the very differential type of approaches coming at different speeds. And I recognizing that of course, certain jurisdiction is a, a desire to move ahead faster or even to be a driver for the changes in the policy regime or the climate regime in, in order to drive the, the changes uh, at the necessary transformative action, so to speak, to address climate change. But I think some things along the trade policy front uh, we may need that probably does need further attention because even when we talk about the carbon price now, there's a huge difference between one dollar and a hundred dollars, depending on where you go. That that doesn't work for businesses and consumers at the end of the day, and businesses at the end of the day are the ones that suffer. But once you talk about that and we talk about carbon border uh, border adjustment measures, then we have to think about how you design a system that doesn't uh, uh, doesn't allow for leakage. But more importantly, and, and coming from also a trade background as well as the climate uh, environment background make sure that it's not in a sign that's a way or operates in a way that's a disguise restriction on trade or, or discriminatory in its effects. And I think from a trade policy angle, those are critical. And I'm not sure, and it would be important uh, that the relevant policymakers on both sides of the equation actually talk about it and, and speak about it. Um, and the methodologies also is another issue that has arisen quite a lot in, even here in the last week. Um, let's just take Article 6 as an example. The, Differences over even 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 issues like where's the baseline? How do you what calculation methodologies? And nobody can can agree as yet. But of course, it's a new issue, and the conversation necessarily has to take place. One only hopes that the conversation doesn't take too long, uh, because climate changes will perhaps supersede these discussions. Uh, so that's a, that's a very useful point to to, to bear in mind. Now. Can I then move on? Um, those are the main observations uh, from, from your report. Um, what about the recommendations? Or are there other recommend, uh, any observations you want to, to, to flag? So, so there's eight recommendations. Maybe I'll run through them quickly and then I would love yeah. to hear from Jeremy his perspective on, on, on them and, and what he's been hearing because he's been here for the first week in COP. I've just arrived. Um, so our eight recommendations, the first is reduce tariffs on climate friendly goods. Um, those would need to be identified and a consensus around the negotiating parties on what they were, but 
we think that would be helpful. A lot of businesses agreed with that. Um, the second is reduce non-tariff distortions. That comes back to what I was saying about the non-tariff uh, barrier agenda. And a lot of work needs to be done on the prioritization around those. Uh, three, phase out fossil fuel subsidies. Um, that's, that's work that's ongoing uh, by some countries. The ACTS, for example, are trying to uh, identify a path forward on how you would legally do that. Um, for uh, a line on carbon-based trade policy, so this is more of a, a probably a discussion at this point in time rather than necessarily getting to clear out neg hard negotiated outcomes within a shorter time frame, but really important for countries to discuss what should be some foundational principles around BCAs, um, how, how do we go around having greater convergence among, around the way of how we account carbon so that it is fair, transparent and not discriminatory. Um, six, and maybe slightly more controversial given the history of trade talks in this area, um, address climate smart agriculture. So have bring that into the, the negotiations on trade and climate, uh, think through what needs to be done there, potentially have discussions around the linkages between market distortions in agriculture and climate objectives. <clears throat> Seven. Probably, uh, quite a politically sensitive topic, I think. I Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We, we <laughs> in there um, knowing that it might might uh, be a, a little bit challenging, but nonetheless felt it was really important and it and it, it was uh, the key sector and, and it was something that the, the lack the challenges around price signals along food uh, uh, supply chains were also raised quite a lot by by um, companies that we talked to that were operating in that sector. Um, seven harness trade agreements to lock in uh, climate action. So, for example, what the EU has done around putting in commitments to the Paris Agreement within the trade deal. I think that just creates extra certainty for business that the parties to that agreement are firmly on track for, for <clears throat> yeah, honoring the Paris Agreement and moving in that direction. And that goes back to the signaling piece that we had. And eight, uh, facilitating green investment. So this comes back a little bit to the question you asked me at the beginning of which countries uh, is this report for? And this in particular, the, the green investment is, is really uh, strongly in the interests of developing countries, which have faced a massive shortfall in FDI uh, since the COVID-19 crisis, including in SDG relevant areas and including in um, things like renewable energy installation. Even that has fallen as capital has kind of frozen up in the last year or so. Um, that shortfall will, is really problematic uh, in terms of helping those countries make that transition and also to do it in a way that drives green growth and jobs um, and, and development. So I think there are ongoing negotiations on investment facilitation for development among 100 plus countries within the remit of the WTO, a plurilateral. And we think it would be really interesting to explore if there are linkages to or if there are specific uh, facilitative actions that would be helpful for governments to take, whether in coalition or, or unilaterally to attract FDI into climate relevant um, uh, sectors or industries in their country. Jeremy, your take on the eight recommendations. Yeah, no, and, and I mean, <laughs> it's a recommendations about it. Because <laughs> I think another question, and it goes back to, to what you, you said earlier, uh, Danielle, about, about yeah. speed and, and you know, how do we make sure that this happens in a way that, that is actually, you know, not, not more blah, 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 as, as Greta might yeah. say. Um, <laughs> and, and, I, and I think it's, I think it's a really important you know, thing to consider. And I think with, with all of these recommendations, I think an important message is that there's not one way of addressing them. You know, there are multiple forums and multiple mechanisms through which these, you know, action on these policies can can be sort of obtained. And, and some of them are, are naturally quicker wins and some of them take more time. But, you know, countries on, on many of these points can actually act on a unilateral level in a way that is, you know, um, you know, fits within the broader, um, you know, objectives of the system. So things like reducing, um, you know, climate friend, tariffs on climate-friendly goods, it's something that, that is better done the broader a consensus you get but it doesn't doesn't require you to have you know a, a broader consensus um amongst amongst countries and so starting to move that forward i think one of the interesting things you see in that space is is you know countries you know perhaps working in, in bilateral or plurilateral forums and sort of singling out climate friendly goods and this is something that, that i think came out in the um, so recently, the, the agreement in principle between the UK and, and New Zealand, talking about the, the, the tariff reductions there. So, you know, that they, they basically said full, full tariff reductions across the board, but they've sort of singled out a specific list of 
climate friendly goods that they have agreed are, are climate friendly goods for the purposes of that agreement and that helps kind of create some momentum i think for other countries to pick up and say okay well look here is a precedent for 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 why these are, are climate friendly goods and and um and that starts you know that helps in moving that discussion um forward um so i think this that, that that's a that's sort of you know, one one comment that, that's across the board with the recommendations. But I think the other point around um, sort of speed and and ensuring that there's there's real pace here is that actually, you know, if we don't have speed, particularly when we're talking about some of these policies like carbon border adjustments and 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 carbon pricing and things, we are going to end up in a situation that is that is you know quite bad. I think you know we're going to have a lot of you know, trade friction. We're going to have a situation where you do, you have different policies with different underlying um, mechanisms and, and methodologies that, that underpin them, and that is going to you know that creates a lot more opportunity for trade protectionism and for for um, you know discrimination to to creep in. And so, if you start the discussion around having you know underlying principles that should underpin these sorts of policies. Then that actually, you know, at least gives you the momentum to, to sort of allow some flexibility in how those policies are implemented internationally, um, but ensures that it's understood what what those rules are. And I think at the moment there's a real concern around policies like like CBAM is that no one is you know quite sure how a WTO panel or or, or the appellate body, if and when it uh, were there, would would grapple with some of these challenges. Um, because it sits in that grey area, there's a lot of room for, uh, you know, countries to develop these policies in a way which is better or worse, you know, mm -hmm. and so that I think is a, is a real thing to watch and, and it, it's going to be much better if we actually get some sort of, you know, consensus it doesn't have to be fully multilateral, but you have, you know, countries starting to agree what these policies should look like and having the discussion there, that is, is, is a critical piece of this, I think. I think I think you're right. I think at the end of the day, what comes through to this conversation, there's really no one size fits all approach. Mm -hmm. uh, you may need all of these features and all of these measures in different ways, in different forms, in different countries. Uh, the, 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 what, what we do need and what seems to be the critical point is you almost like need a theory of everything. That all the policies need to work together coherently and in, in a way that do not uh, detract from existing trade obligations because there's always the fear and there's always a concern uh, that you know that it operates in a protectionistic manner or discriminatory manner. You know, even if we talk about the carbon border adjustment measures, that that is really one critical um, criticism that you know it was it was introduced. Um, is it real? Was it really introduced to address carbon leakage, or was it introduced to address some sort of domestic political package, so to speak, as we have been talking about this before? Um, and, and another, but at the same time, I do see also the mess of what you mentioned about who is going to move first. And on some areas, it may be less controversial, um, and, and it may be there may be less reticence on the part of states to move first. For example, unilaterally liberalizing uh, tariffs on certain types of goods. But it's not so easy in other cases where the countries may want to hold it back for the necessary trade-offs in negotiations or something like that. That's real politics, and that can't be helped. Um, and one, one question, I'm not sure whether this would be something that you, you, you would want to speak on, but this was also mentioned in the report. You talked about sustainable financing. And when you talk about sustainable financing, what, what was mentioned, about, and this came out a lot in the in conversations last week in the, in the side events. Um, so we're talking about sustainable financing, we're talking about taxonomies that go with it. And, and there, there is another set of difficulties on in itself because you have the EU taxonomy, now you have the UK taxonomy that company is this announcement last week of a mandatory disclosure, um, sort of climate risk disclosure regime. You have about 20 other jurisdictions around the world all looking at developing that taxonomy. Um, and that, that question really is, uh, you know, it, it seems rather fragmented. Um, and each, each, each jurisdiction seems to be developing it on their own accord. Um, the, only, the only bright spark, if I could put it that way, was actually the common taxonomy that was announced last, uh, last week between the EU and China. Now that's perhaps a good starting point um, as to the conversations and the multilateral conversations that need to come about. Um, from the industry side, what I've heard is that, you know, in terms of the taxonomy, is it sufficiently comprehensive? Um, you know, the figures were mentioned that it covers something like less than 1% of investment um, activities. I'm not really sure whether that's accurate or not, but those are the numbers, really low numbers. Uh, and the question is that if financial institutions and lenders 
base their investment FDIs on certain sets of taxonomy, um, would it actually be counterproductive to what the objectives that the aims you mentioned earlier of driving FDIs to economies that actually need uh, these kind of uh, uh, financing and technology. So it's a thought that I think um, probably uh, would be useful to, to study further uh, and to consider further. I, I, I've, I've not had time to really think too much about it, but I do think it's an issue that we might wanna pay attention to as well. Now, try, uh, incorporating uh, um, uh, trade, uh, climate agreements into trade agreements is an interesting concept. I think this was tried in some previous negotiations before. I think one, one question really is um, to what extent would it undermine, if at all, uh, the fundamental basis of, of Paris Agreement, which is a ground up. It was designed as a ground up. The compliance mechanism is really a facilitating implementation, encouraging compliance. It's not a, the usual sort of a punitive uh, WTO type of regime. Um, so the question is, uh, if they're like-minded, perhaps that may be so, uh, but uh, for others, uh, it may actually be counterproductive practice of the Paris Agreement. But again, it's a question that uh, useful food for thought. Conversation, which is the relationship between and within IGOs, the international organizations. Um, I, it was actually a very good uh, high level dialogue convened last week uh, by Chatham House, just over the weekend actually, involving the leaders of the WTO, the World Bank, UNEP, UNTAC, ITC. And they were talking about this question of, of the interrelationship between trade, climate, and nature, and addressing the question of how cooperation on trades can support climate action and sustainable development. And I thought that was such a pertinent observation that, that goes directly to the core of the discussion we have today. The panel unanimously agreed in feed on the need for number one, policy coherence, and two, breaking down the silos between the regimes of trade, climate, of course, and nature. And in addition, apart from the substantive breaking down of silos, there was also a recognition of the need to break down the silos between international organization. That is between, say, the WTO, the UNEP, the developmental banks, for example, the age of member agencies that operate so far, and, and this was actually mentioned during the panel, operated within their respective spheres and mandates. So in the same way that you see in some countries, the climate, the environment, and the trade ministers and policymakers operating in their own spheres, you see this also. Uh, at least this was mentioned during the panel, there's the recognition that this was also the situation um, in the past, but obviously now there's a recognition and a cohesive move towards a coherence even among the processes of these um, um, organizations. Uh, during the debate itself, um, the WTO Deputy Director General Jean-Marie Calgon described this point that we are being a somewhat of an inflection point, and he fully anticipates, or rather he expects, and we shall see if this indeed happens. He expects the climate agenda to enter the trade agenda at the next WTO ministerial conference that is going to start very, very soon, shortly after COP. So I think this is a good century to your, to your views, perhaps if I may ask, mm -hmm. on the future of the WTO discussions in on the linkages between trade and the environment. You've talked about, uh, Kimberly, you've talked about certain processes that are already in place. Um, you know, the negotiations on environmental good agreements have basically stalled for several years. Uh, but there is indeed ongoing discussions on liberalizing trade in environmental goods and services. There is this uh, parallel uh, plurilateral agreement uh, that's being discussed right now on climate, trade and sustainability, about New Zealand, Costa Rica, Fiji, Iceland and Switzerland. Um, so against this background, what are your thoughts on the kind of initiatives and outcomes that you would expect or you would like to see coming out from the 12 ministerial conference towards such coherence and alignment? It's a good question. So um, positively, we are seeing a group of 50 plus, I think it's now at 60 countries, um, have over the last year been engaged in something called the trade and environmental sustainability discussions. Uh, Jeremy and I both sat in on those. Um, one of the unique uh, features of it is that they've invited stakeholders to join their discussions, which is not the case with the traditional WTO committees. And that's yeah. coming from a recognition that solving the problems that we face on environmental sustainability, including climate change, really needs to be a, a partnership uh, across all of society, business, consumers and governments. Um, so I think that's really forward leaning. Um, 
The group has been discussing various topics over the last year, including circular economy and climate change, and they plan to launch a declaration at MC12, signaling commitment to future discussions and actions. This might sound like a micro step forward, but actually it is significant that they are creating a space for what I see is essentially being able to then land different plurilateral outcomes based on interest. And that was coming to what Jeremy was saying earlier. I think that that space will allow for interesting discussion among all participants, but then also they'll probably start to identify the like-minded among them who want to move forward on uh, liberalizing environmental goods and services, others who maybe want to do something on eco-labeling, others who want to talk about climate, smart agriculture, circular economy, et cetera. And, and those, the way that those different things get taken forward may be more or less binding, more or less discursive versus um, mm. clear negotiations. So that's really positive because it's creating the space for countries to be able to have these exchanges and to deepen knowledge together with stakeholders. And significantly, um, the group did not include uh, neither China nor the US until about a month ago. China joined a month ago and the US joined last week. So that's really positive that the EU has already has been involved in it from the start. So you've really got a lot of um, uh, the world's major economies participating in that. And 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 and, and the, the fact that they are actually talking to each other, given all the other tensions we have yeah. is really good. Yeah. yeah. To what extent do the stakeholders contribute? Uh, you know, you said you're present there at those discussions, so there's transparency. To what extent do you have access and, you know, be able to contribute to discussions or submit proposals or things like that? So we've been able to provide interventions and ideas throughout the discussions. Um, okay. I don't think it's really for stakeholders to be putting forward proposals, but certainly we've been able to share all of our reports okay. and ideas and, and, and research, um, and okay. as have others, including environmental groups and then other, other business groups too. Thank you. And just to add, I understand one sort of perspective generally on the WTO's role in, in all of this. And I think, you know, the focus of the WTO, rightly, I think, has, has often been on, you know, sort of the, you know, two of the three pillars, the negotiating pillar, the dispute settlement pillar, um, and and both of those have some challenges. The negotiating pillar has, has had challenges for a long time. Dispute settlement more recently is, is, is problematic. But there is, a, there is another aspect, which is, which is this sort of consultative um, and, and information sharing and transparency element to, to the WTO. And I think that's actually a really important thing to bear in mind, particularly in the context of these discussions. Because what, what we've sort of, you know, been talking about in, in, in this discussion today is, is around the fact that countries will move at different speeds and they will move in different ways towards achieving their objectives. And there's no sort of, I think, you know, while it might be nice that everyone moved in the same way and, and was had perfect coherence, I think the reality is that's that's unlikely. However, at least by, by being there and being, you know, uh, involved in those discussions and understanding the directions and the sensitivities and the ways that other countries are, are going to take this forward. And as Kimberly says, identifying, you know, you know, commonality within those groups and the ability to sort of design policies that, that are consistent with that direction. That's actually a, a really valuable thing. So while it, while it can be at risk of, of sounding a bit like more blah blah blah, it, it is it is I think a really important um, uh, you know thing to 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 consider actually that that, that does have value where it's moving um, you know things in, in in a direction. I think countries, as I say, they are moving in a direction. They're, they're, this stuff is happening, and it's not as if you know, countries are going to say, well, we haven't reached agreement on, on CBAM, so we're just not going to do anything. I think what the EU proposals have shown is that, you know, we're now at a point where this is so critical and there's, there's you know, so, you know, we're so close to convergence between trade and climate issues that things will happen. I think that is the sort of external pressure point that, that requires countries to actually consider how it affects them and, and, and what they're going to do to participate in that discussion. And so I think the WTO can be a very useful forum for that, even if it's not sort of, you know, uh, as perfect as, as, as agreeing a, a multilateral principle on how to, how to implement a, a carbon border adjustment. I think having that discussion is nevertheless um, a, a very important uh, thing that the WTO can offer to this debate. Just one more Thank thing, Danielle, you, you mentioned earlier the, the, the sort of slight, the interesting thing that you saw on Saturday with the two institutions, the two different tracks coming together. I think it's worth remembering that 
international environment law is not the same as international trade law. And those mm -hmm. two things have evolved in different tracks and have, have different consensus around them. There, there are some similarities, but ultimately the WTO has its body of law. It's being developed by a group of people and, and governments in a certain mindset. And then we have the consensus that's emerged um, within the UNFCCC space. And mm -hmm. these two worlds are maybe not necessarily on a course for conflict, but if there isn't this kind of dialogue and if we don't try and actually uh, have some kind of osmosis between the two, then there will be conflict because slightly different consensus have, have been landed on and different principles govern those worlds. Um, so that's why I think these, in a way, some of the blah, blah, blah is useful because it's actually, if, as long as it's blah, blah, blah with people having <laughs> constructive as to try and understand how we land between those different principles going forward. Absolutely. We need constructive blah, 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 not hot air, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, exactly. Think blah, blah, blah has pretty much entered the lexicon. I won't be surprised it appears in the Oxford Dictionary next year. Um, so, <laughs> so, but, but what, is, what, 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 what comes through is, is, um, is a very encouraging the, uh, observations by Jeremy, uh, which really parallels the, 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 the sense, at least here, at least the conversations here, and it's my own observation as well, that there's been a lot of emphasis in the statements uh, by, by leaders and negotiators of, of a need and, and, and also a readiness to engage in global cooperation. A return to multilateralism, if you will, which I think is one of the positive takeaways. Now, obviously, it remains to be seen how it will actually operate and, and, and you know, become a tangible result. But at least we're talking, uh, at least that shared common language, which, which hasn't been unfortunately seen um, in a while or heard in a while. So let's let's look at that. Bear in mind of, of course, there's very real politic of geograph uh, geopolitical con and trade contestation and, and trade debates and, and even and the coupling between the two economies, which is the, uh, the buzzword at the moment and, and a fear is a, a huge fear and concern of, among those in the business community. So the question really remains as to how and when this coherence and then this consensus uh, between trade and, and climate action uh, will occur on that plane as well in real terms. Um, so those are my concluding remarks, which I will leave to you um, uh, for, for your uh, final comments, if any. And, and if I may also, before we end, invite your comments on and rather your thoughts on what your hopes and expectations are for COP26. Do you want to start? Because you've been here for a week. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I think... I mean, look, I think <laughs> I, I, it's always, it, I'm always nervous to, to sort of uh, put, 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 a, uh, put, a, put a hope or an expectation on any particular outcome because I think there are a number of possible outcomes on a number of possible issues that are, that are positive and some that are not so positive. But I think, uh, you know, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to sort of put my finger on one particular thing that I think needs to come out of this discussion um, this, this week. However, I think what what is really encouraging um you know certainly from my experience here over the last few days has been actually how much is is sort of genuinely happening across a number of different disciplines in support of the objectives of you know these climate negotiations so whether it's this trade discussion we're having now whether it's you know as, as you mentioned before some of these you know, quite significant discussions, I think, that have come up this week around, you know, the role of, of multilateral development banks and, and, and the role of international finance in, you know, active, more actively supporting the, 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 the agenda towards, um, you know, decarbonisation, whether it's the fact that, you know, you've had, you know, hundreds of, of, of businesses and, and NGOs and, and governments making co commitments over the course of the last couple of weeks that really do start to put you um, on, on, a, on a pathway that is getting closer to, you know, 1.5 degrees. And I think I think there was a report, you know, recently saying that it, it, it looks like based on the commitments that we have now, that, you know, that takes us to 1.8 degrees. So we're not, we're not quite there, but that's, that's a lot more significant, um, you know, if those, those pledges are honoured um, towards getting to the point that we, that we need to get to if we're, we're going to really, um, you know, solve this crisis and, and mitigate the worst aspects of, of climate change. So I think that's, that's a really positive aspect. And I think my hope is that, firstly, that those, that those pledges get honoured and that we actually mm -hmm. sort of, 
find a way to ensure that we don't walk away from these discussions and just, you know, say, well, that's great. We'll, we'll wait for another year and then we'll decide how we how we actually implement that domestically and, and within our companies. Because I think that is a that is a real risk. Um, that it's, it's it's easier to to say things in a, in a in a forum like this than it is to actually go back home and 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 sell it domestically. And so I think it's really important to to watch that and keep that pressure on. Um, you know, both both in in, in all aspects of, um, of of society to ensure that we're we're holding governments and companies to account for for some of those pledges that they're making. And I think that's a that's kind of a key takeaway. It's not just about this week. It's really about you know the weeks that follow and the years that follow um, to, to to ensure we get to to the objective that we're all here for. Indeed, uh, away from the cameras, what happens uh, behind the cameras is just really the question. Kimberly, yeah, I, I would echo that. That's my impression coming in is that there is a lot that's going on. So for me, I, I said to people, the fact that a cop is being held, given everything <laughs> that in the last two years and and given how many people are here uh, and i know there's been some criticism that why is everyone flying here and not everyone is critical to the negotiations but actually i do believe that as jeremy said the discussions that are happening both inside the formal negotiations and outside are critical because they're allowing the connections and the knowledge exchange to be formed and the partnerships to emerge that hopefully if we continue to act on them that that is what moves us forward maybe it's not always perfect but I think we said in our report that it's critical to not let the um, uh, the perfect be the enemy of the good and if we don't get certain key outcomes this week for example on article 6 or elsewhere then I'm a, um, a positive realist so I would hope that those that uh, are willing and interested will find alternatives way forward it, it may lead to some challenges as a result of not having multilateral consensus on certain key things. But ultimately, as long as um, there is that willingness to keep implementing, to keep transitioning, coming from both the private uh, civil society and governments, then I think um, that that is a good outcome from this week. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy and Kimberly. For um, it has turned out that we've been talking for about an hour, uh, so that has been a very, uh, very fruitful conversation. And I thank you both for sharing your time um, and your insights. And I enjoyed this conversation personally quite a bit, and I, I'm sure the audience uh, will as well. So thank you very much. Have a good day and a safe trip to to Glasgow. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.